I'm Marty MacArthur, president of Wild Ones River City Grand Rapids, Michigan chapter. And I want to welcome all of you who are attending our meeting this evening. Before we start the program portion of our meeting, we have a few announcements for our chapter members and attendees this evening. We welcome both members and non-members to our meetings because we want as many people as possible to benefit from the knowledge they get from our programs. We hope that if you're not a member, you will consider joining our Wild Ones River City Grand Rapids chapter. If you would like to join, simply go to rivercitywildones.org and on the menu, click the Join tab. Be sure to de designate River City Wild Ones as your chapter. This year is the 45th anniversary of the National Wild Ones Organization. In 1977, nine people attended a conference in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they decided to make some changes in the plants in their yards and in their yards and gardens. Now, 45 years later, Wild Ones currently has 67 chapters and 19 seedling chapters in 26 states. This is an amazing accomplishment and something to celebrate. Happy anniversary, Wild Ones. Our meetings in April and May will be in-person field trips. On April 18th, our program will be a hike through the Hudsonville Nature Center to see the spring ephemerals. Craig Elston, naturalist, photographer, and Wild Ones member, has an amazing knowledge of the botanical flora at the Hudsonville Nature Center. What a wonderful way to celebrate the season of spring and the early flowering plants. Our meeting on May 18th will be an opportunity to make a difference by helping to remove garlic mustard from Rogue River Park. We will also have a plant exchange that night. So if you have some plants that you would like to share with others, you'll be able to do so that evening. More information on these free programs will be in our member e-news on our website and on our Facebook page. I know that we are all longing to get back into our gardens and that we are looking forward to adding plants, native plants to our gardens. To help in your search for native plants, there will be two opportunities to buy native plants at the Fulton Street Farmers Market on two Fridays in June. On June 3rd and on June 24th, members of the Na Native Plant Guild will be selling native plants at the Wild Ones booths. Wild Ones members will have information on native plants and on how to become a member of Wild Ones for those who have questions. We will also have our annual native plant sale in July where you will be able to purchase additional native plants. Linda, our vice president, would like, you, like to tell you about our anniversary celebration in June. Thanks, Marty. Oh, yep. Yeah. Thanks, Marty. Um, I just want to say also before I get into the um, anniversary event that there's so many uh, folks from out of town and out of state, out of the Grand Rapids area. Check to see if there's a Wild Ones chapter in your area and um, if it might be something that you would like to join because there's a lot of Wild Ones chapters all over the country. Um, okay, so. Plans are moving along, um, right along for our 15 year anniversary celebration. The celebration will be here in Grand Rapids on Monday, June 20th at the Aquinas College Performing Arts Center. There will be an expo from five to seven with exhibits by local con conservation organizations. Um, they will have some great information about our local environmental issues and ways to get involved. And a couple of our exhibitors have um, told us that they will be giving away some native plants. At seven, our program will begin. Dr. Doug Tallamy will be presenting on his book, Nature's Best Hope. Dr. Doug Tallamy is a nationally known entomologist and an expert on biodiversity. A few of his books will be available for purchase and Dr. Tallamy will be signing books um, before and after his presentation. Thanks to our generous sponsors, this event is free, but you will need to register due to limited seating. 
Registration will begin on May 1st, and you can find information about how to do that on our website. We really hope you can join us for this great event. Thanks, Marty. Thank you, Linda. The Anniversary Celebration Committee has been planning for the past two years for this event, and it's going to be wonderful. Have you heard about our challenge to all our members? Doug Ptolemy is leading a nationwide project of trying to create the largest national park in the United States by encouraging anyone who has some soil in their yards to plant native plants and to report it on the National Homegrown Park website. We would love to be able to say to Doug Ptolemy when he comes in June that Wild Ones members have met the challenge and that the numbers of new listings is a direct result of Wild Ones members stepping up and becoming part of the Homegrown National Park. If you are wondering how to get your property listed, go to our website, rivercitywildones.org. Watch the tutorial video that board member Linda Schuster recorded to help make the process easier. After that, get your property listed as part of the park. The goal is to create zones and communities of plants so that the insects, birds, bees, and butterflies can withstand a bad year without being completely wiped out. Now, Linda Gary, our vice president and chair of our program committee this year, will introduce our speaker, Nathan Hahn. Thank you all for attending our program this evening. Thanks, Marty. Um, Dr. Nate Hahn is our speaker tonight. Um, he has been a speaker before for our Wild Ones group, but it's been a few years. We are really excited to have him here tonight to update us about monarch butterfly habitat and the research that he has been involved in. Before I introduce Nate, um, there's some housekeeping items that I want to remind you about. Most of you are pretty good at the Zoom webinar thing after the last couple of years, but just in case, I want to call your attention to the two buttons at the bottom of your screen. There is a chat button there where you can type in comments during the presentation as you have been doing with your um, name and location. And that is also where we will post websites and other links that correlate with the program. The Q&A button is for you to type in questions that you would like Dr. Hahn to answer at the end of his presentation. I think there'll probably be a lot of questions. Dr. Hahn will be answering as many as possible but we also have some additional resource folks that have a lot of monarch knowledge who will be typing in some of the answers in the chat and the Q&A. Um, lastly, you will receive an email in a couple of days with a short survey and links to the resources that Nate mentions. It will also include an, a link with information about becoming a part of the homegrown national park movement. Okay, so, um, Tonight, uh, Dr. Hahn's presentation is called Managing Habitat for Monarch Butterflies. Dr. Hahn will give an overview of the ecology and natural history of monarch butterflies and share some of his research group's findings related to monarch conservation, their relationship to their milkweed host plant, and their interactions with other arthropods. Nate is a Grand Rapids native, and he was the project coordinator for the Plaster Creek Stewards at Calvin University before he moved on to get his graduate degrees. At our February meeting, we learned about the Plaster Creek Stewards and all the good work that they are doing here in Grand Rapids. If you are interested, you can view that program on a YouTube link that you can find on our website. So Nate completed his master's at the University of Michigan and his PhD at the University of Washington. He currently works as an ecologist and a researcher at Michigan State University. His research focuses on interactions between insects and plants with the goal of using ecological science to help inform biodiversity conservation and agricultural sustainability. Please welcome Nate Hahn. Are you there, Nate? Hello. Am I coming through? Yep. Good, yep. great. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's great to see so many people are excited to hear about monarch butterflies and native plants. And um, yeah, so let's get started. Yeah, my talk is called uh, Managing Habitat for Monarch Butterflies. And 
I thought I'd back up for just a second and give you a little information about what I do, because monarch butterflies kind of fit within a bigger picture. So uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Washington, I worked with this little orange butterfly on the left called Taylor's checker spot, uh, which is an endangered butterfly and uh, worked to understand relationships between this butterfly and its host plants. Um, and then use that to help inform ecological restoration in grasslands in uh, Western Washington. And uh, yeah, so that's one of the projects I've been interested in. Um, more recently, over the last few years at Michigan State, I've been involved in some work with uh, monarch butterfly conservation. That's what I'll be talking about today. Um, and then actually a lot of my work in the last couple of years has been kind of bigger picture ecology of insects at landscape scales. So thinking about how we could do agricultural management and maybe design and manage landscapes in ways that um, are that most conducive to insect biodiversity and to harnessing ecosystem services like pollination and pest control, good things that insects do for us. So all of that stuff is what I do, uh, but today we're talking just about monarchs, but I thought it might be helpful to just have a little little background on on what I'm up to. Um, and since this is a wild ones talk and there are lots of yard, front yard gardeners here, I'll show you a picture of my front yard garden full of milkweeds and other native plants and full of insects as a result. So I, I have the privilege of doing that because I'm the one with the controls right now. But uh, <laughs> yeah, if you're not into gardening with native plants, you should strongly consider it. It's a lot of fun. It's super rewarding. You get to see changes throughout the year and you get to bring, uh, you know, wildlife, insects and birds uh, right up to your window. So highly encourage it. OK, so what I want to cover tonight is uh, first, we'll just talk about monarch butterfly, the basics of their natural history and ecology, because it's pretty wild. Monarchs are they're really wild. Um, and I have to admit, since we have sort of a national audience, this is going to have a very Eastern bias. I'll try to talk about the Western monarch populations as well, but I'm in Michigan and that's sort of my area of expertise. So we're going to have an Eastern bias. I want you to know that. Um, after we've talked about some basic monarch natural history, we'll talk about monarchs and milkweed um, and some management you can do in your yard and stuff, but kind of as a gateway to thinking more broadly about native plants and insect conservation and the things you can do for monarchs that are um, beneficial to lots of other organisms as well. Because if you are if you're a monarch and milkweed enthusiast, as I am, um, they can be a gateway into a wild world of insect ecology and native plants. And there's a whole lot out there. You're just seeing the tip of the iceberg with monarchs and milkweed. So I wanna, I'll, I'll wander a little bit away from monarchs. Um, and then finally, I'll talk a little bit about our research group's recent work uh, on research with monarch butterflies and thinking about conservation and managing vegetation and stuff. So, so that's what I'll cover and we can get started. So monarch butterflies, uh, their scientific name is Danaeus plexippus. They're in a family called Nymphalidae or the brush-footed butterflies. It's a really big butterfly family that has a lot of kind of large conspicuous butterflies you might recognize. And here is their uh, life cycle depicted. So they go through complete metamorphosis. So the female monarchs will lay a few hundred eggs that look like uh, what you see up top here. And it, on a printed sheet of paper, the period at the end of a sentence, that's about how big this egg is. In, in uh, This is under a microscope here. The eggs hatch and produce caterpillars or larvae that look like this, this very iconic sort of tiger striped caterpillar with the black tentacles. Um, and then after a few weeks of feeding on milkweed plants, they will pupate or make a chrysalis like you see here. And then after about two weeks, that chrysalis will open up to reveal a very scrunched up butterfly that will eventually harden off its wings and fly away. So that's their life cycle. And most generations, that's going to take um, maybe four weeks or so to complete. So that's, that's the, the big picture of their life cycle. And within the larval stage, I want to mention that there are different what are called instars or growth stages. So uh, when, a, when an egg hatches, at first you have a very tiny first instar caterpillar. Um, and then at the end of each instar, their exoskeleton actually cracks open and a new instar crawls out and has a little bit different morphology. And if you think of a caterpillar kind of like an accordion, 
um, they, as they eat, like the very hungry caterpillar, right? As they eat, they stretch out and they stretch out. And once they've sort of maxed out their current body size, then they'll uh, molt and a new morph, will, a new uh, instar will pop out that has a, that can continue the accordion stretching. Um, so at first, first instar caterpillars are pretty hard to see. They're really tiny. Um, when you see a big like inch long or longer tiger striped, very iconic monarch butterfly caterpillar looking thing with black tentacles, that's a fourth or fifth instar uh, caterpillar. So each of these stages lasts just a couple of days. The fifth instar is a little longer, um, but yeah. So that's your quick overview of what they're up to as larvae. And now I want to talk about one of the really exciting monarch natural history pieces, and that is their relationship with their host plants, milkweed. So monarchs are dietary specialists. They only lay eggs on, and the larvae can only feed on milkweeds. That's in contrast to the adults that just sip nectar to get their calories. Um, so they're looking for nectar from various flowers, but the caterpillars can only eat milkweeds. So milkweeds are plants in the genus Asclepius. There's a couple of related genuses that uh, they can also eat sometimes, but for our purposes, they're in the genus Asclepius. There are several species of milkweed. Um, and I'll go through a couple of the common ones that we find in Michigan. So this is the most common milkweed. It's called common milkweed, Asclepius syriaca. And this is the one you might see growing on roadsides. It's most likely to be volunteering in your backyard. Uh, it grows, you know, in agricultural settings and also in prairies, but really kind of dunes, any kind of open sunny habitat. This is a pretty common plant to see, but it's native to Eastern North America, um, has nice pink flowers. You might also know it because it's quite an aggressive weed actually in some contexts, it'll spread quite a bit. It has a very robust below ground root system. Uh, that will send up new shoots all over the place and uh, it can actually be if you didn't want it which you usually you should want it around but if you didn't it's actually kind of hard to get rid of um, so so that's common milkweed our most abundant species where i'm from there are some really other interesting species as well though so butterfly weed asclepius tuberosa is this like really almost radioactive looking orange um, milkweed uh, and this is a native plant that's a little bit more conservative. It grows in sandy prairies and savannas, that kind of habitat. It's usually in well-drained soils, south-facing slopes that get a lot of sun exposure. Uh, and monarchs will use this one as well. Uh, swamp milkweed, which like its name suggests, likes to get its feet wet, uh, but it'll grow in a garden context as well, even if it's not too wet. This is Asclepius incarnato with beautiful sort of pinkish purplish flowers. Um, this is another one monarchs really like to use. Um, and if you are planting or observing milkweeds, you'll notice there are actually lots of specialist herbivores, not just monarchs who will go after them. So um, I hope this video is working. I think so. Uh, so this is the milkweed tussock moth. Uh, when these caterpillars get a little bigger, they'll look kind of like a toothbrush. They have little tussocks on them. Um, and this is another specialist herbivore, one of about a dozen of them that you can see on milkweeds. Um, that also specialize just on milkweeds. So there's lots of exciting herbivores beyond monarchs. I know these are, this, this video I've chosen, they're not the most charismatic or beautiful compared to monarchs, but they have a really cool natural history as well. So there's a whole world of milkweed herbivores. Milkweeds will also, they're great nectar sources, so they'll bring in all sorts of other insects uh, beyond monarchs. So this is a Baltimore checker spot that's come to nectar on common milkweed. Um, and the flower here has this really interesting morphology. Uh, it sort of has these, these five hoods, and those will fill up like a bucket of nectar. So a lot of things come visit them. In the morning, if you take a common milkweed flower and sort of shake it out, or uh, in fluorescence, a cluster of flowers, and sort of shake it out on your hand, there's so much nectar that it'll, go, it'll kind of spatter everywhere, spill out. So uh, it's a great nectar plant. By the way, milkweed has a really exciting and strange pollination system, too, that I can't get into. Um, but it has a very unique and wonky pollination system too. So something for you to Google on your own if you're interested, just milkweed pollination should do it. Um, oh, I wanted to show you this video too. This is um, an example of what a butterfly magnet milkweeds can be. So I'll start it. I hope it's working. I'll trust that it's working. So this is a um, butterfly weed that I found in an oak savanna in West Michigan. Uh, that was just coated in insects. So tons and tons of bees 
and butterflies. So that's a great spangled fritillary. I should have reviewed this beforehand. Let's see if I can identify things. Lots of fritillaries. Um, and then I think a coral hair streak. They really like butterfly weed. Um, the point being, they're amazing insect magnets. So just really fun. That's butterfly weed living up to its name, covered in butterflies. OK, so back to monarchs in milkweed. Uh, we'll start right at the beginning of uh, the larval cycle and then uh, move, move from there. Um, when a monarch egg hatches, that caterpillar is on a milkweed plant, and that's a very dangerous uh, landscape to be on. Milkweeds have evolved lots of um, defenses against herbivorous insects, against things that want to eat them. Um, fortunately for monarchs, they have co-evolved and counter-adapted ways to get around all of the interesting things that milkweeds do to try to get rid of herbivores. So it's a fun story to tell. Uh, when So let's see, the defenses on milkweeds are first, they have, they're covered in little silvery hairs called trichomes that are serve a defensive function. Uh, you can kind of see they look a little velvety there, right? Um, second, milkweeds are um, charged up with pressurized, specialized pressurized cells full of milky latex. That's how they get their name, right? Milkweed. If you've ever broken a stem, you've seen that. Um, that stuff is uh, A, laced with uh, a toxin, uh, cardenolides or cardiac glycosides, and B, it's really gummy stuff. So uh, if a caterpillar is to get a face full of it, it will actually, uh, they can drown in it if they're small enough, and it can gum up their mandibles so they're not able to feed and then they starve. However, monarchs have a whole set of behaviors to get around all that stuff. So this little circular picture on the left shows a first instar caterpillar about to take some of its first bites. Um, and the first thing they do is actually shave down the trichomes off the leaf. So if you look closely, you can see there's sort of a C-shaped area that's a little bit darker, and that's where it's uh, bitten off all the trichomes so it can actually get down to the leaf surface. The next thing they have to do is bite into the leaf, and they'll actually diffuse those pressurized latex cells. So you can see that there, there's sort of a C-shape of drops of latex, and those are cells that have been strategically snapped open so that they're diffused and the pressure is relieved. And now within that area, that tiny little caterpillar can start to feed on the leaf um, unencumbered by those other defenses. So it's a really cool story. And older, bigger caterpillars will actually go to the main midrib of the leaf, um, the, you know, the, the, the middle part of it, on the bottom, and they'll chew through it and basically diffuse the whole leaf so the leaf wilts and the latex is depressurized, and then they'll go in and eat the leaf. So pretty cool uh, defenses there. And lastly, uh, monarchs have uh, adapted to the cardiac glycosides that milkweeds produce. So if um, they're toxic to generalist uh, insects that eat this plant or that plant, the cardenolides would kill them. Um, if we had high doses of it, it could mess with our heartbeat or even stop our heart. So it's a pretty serious uh, compound, but monarchs are not affected by it. And in fact, they accumulate it in their body and sequester it and co-opt it as a defense against their predators. So things like birds and uh, other predatory insects. They make themselves poisonous by stealing stuff from milkweeds, which is a really cool concept, right? And happens a lot in the insect world. Um, and this is actually part of why they have the coloration that they do. They're what's called aposematic or warningly colored and unpalatable, uh, which is a interesting because to us they're beautiful but that's actually like a danger danger sign oh here's a picture on the left i forgot about this of a caterpillar that did not behave uh strategically and got a big face full of latex so this one's in danger of uh, being mired in latex or not being able to use its mouth parts anymore okay this photo here is from a famous study by Lincoln Brower, who's one of the was one of the foremost experts on monarch butterfly biology over the last several decades and made a lot of the interesting discoveries that I'm talking about now. Uh, and he did this clever study when they were figuring out what's going on with monarchs and things that eat them and milkweeds and the toxic compounds in milkweeds, uh, fed monarch butterflies to birds to see what would happen. So here's a jay eating a monarch. Here's a jay a few minutes later vomiting up a monarch because they're very unpalatable to predators. So just a really remarkable piece of natural history, right? 
Okay, so that was monarchs and their relationship with milkweed in one way that they're really interesting and remarkable. Let's talk about their migratory cycle, which is another way that they're really interesting and remarkable. So this is an overwintering colony of monarchs, and this is, uh, looks like it's in California based on the plant that they're hanging on. Um, they make these, they have an amazing long distance migratory cycle, and they spend winters instead of you know hiding in the leaf litter or laying eggs and then letting the eggs overwinter, they fly all the way to a hospitable climate and then they cling to, in big groups, they cling to vegetation and wait out the winter and then fly back north in the spring, which is really cool and uh, an amazing thing to behold, kind of one of the wonders of the world, right? These overwintering aggregations. So here's a map that the Xerxes Society has put together um, of the migratory cycle. And I'll start on the east and then I'll explain the west. Um, in the winter, see this red dot down here in Mexico, in the highlands of central Mexico, in the winter, monarchs overwinter in these dense aggregations and they're hanging in um, oil fir trees, so a specific kind of fir tree. And then in the spring, that aggregation, those that survive the winter will fly north into this sort of orange area that you see here. They'll lay eggs on milkweeds in the southern US, um, Texas, Louisiana, etc. And they'll go through the larval phase and when the adults emerge they'll fly further north and those are the ones that if you're in Michigan those are the ones that uh, arrive late May maybe early June in our area and they might look a little bit draggled because they had to fly all the way up from Arkansas or Louisiana or somewhere to get here um, and they'll lay eggs and then over the course of the summer in where I live in Michigan there are two to three generations so they'll They'll build up their population in up here in their breeding ground. Uh, and then at the end of the summer, around September, the adults that emerge, instead of mating and laying eggs on milkweed and continuing to build the population, they're in reproductive diapause, which basically means they're not going for reproduction. They're wired to do something else and they will fly all the way south to Mexico. So again, it's sort of a staggered generation thing where they where they sequentially move northward in the spring but then in the fall that last generation actually flies all the way south to mexico which is really remarkable so that means one butterfly that emerges as an adult in september in let's say grand rapids michigan flies all the way to mexico and if it survives that flight spends the whole winter hanging in a fir tree and if it survives that flies north to texas and lays eggs before it dies so that's pretty remarkable for an insect to do something like that. Um, meanwhile, in the Western part of the country, uh, instead of overwintering in fir trees in Mexico, monarchs overwinter along the Pacific coast. And I have to admit, again, as a, as a resident of Eastern North America, I don't know as much about the Western migratory cycle. And in fact, people in general don't know as much about it. It's a little more mysterious. It's not as well studied, but uh, they overwinter along the Pacific coast and then uh, spend spring and summer moving inland into the, into the west um, where they're using uh, a number of different milkweed species. And then they head back uh, to, to the coast for the winter. And there's probably a little bit of exchange where sometimes Eastern, maybe Western monarchs fly to Mexico and maybe sometimes monarchs from Mexico fly there. They're not totally isolated populations, but they're at least pretty isolated, I think. Um, there's also a year-round resident population of monarchs in Florida that doesn't migrate. They just stay in Florida, and they're mostly using tropical milkweeds uh, that have been introduced there. So really interesting populations with different approaches and stuff, yeah. All right, so that was their migratory cycle. Monarchs are, even though as a child I thought they were, you know, just the most common interesting but really abundant butterfly. That's not exactly the case. They've been in decline. So the eastern monarch population, here's a graph of its decline. So the way that they monitor the population is not by counting individuals. There's too many. Instead, they measure the area of overwintering ground that is occupied. So how many acres or hectares in this case um, are, full, are, are coated in a carpet of monarchs. And you can see that in the 90s, numbers were high and they've gone down, down, down. So we normally say there's been about an 80% decline, although of course it depends on which year you pick, which two years you pick to calculate that. Um, the alarm really sounded in 2013 and 2014 uh, when the population was really, really tiny. And it's been a, it's 
ticked up a little bit since then. Um, but this red line here is um, ecologists who've done some population modeling to determine what do we think is the overwintering area size that's big enough that they're not at acute risk of this population going extinct. And it's at about six hectares. And we've only hit that threshold once since 2007. So uh, they, they, we need to manage them to increase the population size if we're gonna avoid extinction risk. And they were uh, proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and that decision came out hmm, several months ago, I guess. And it was decided that listing them at, under the Endangered Species Act was warranted, but precluded, which is kind of a funny way of saying, yeah, they deserve to be listed, but they're precluded because there are other higher priority listings that we're focusing on now. Um, so it's sort of kicking the can down the road a little bit. So that's the Eastern monarch population. The Western monarch population has undergone really severe declines since the 1980s. And it's not as, I'll get into causes of decline uh, next. The causes of decline in Western monarch populations are a little bit, um, it's, it's really hard to know what exactly is going on there. Um, but there was total panic um, in the 2020 to 2021 winter uh, when there were fewer than 2,000 butterflies total counted out of what, you know, many years ago would have been like a million. So uh, that was a that was a, a big alarm moment. Um, and then surprise, surprise, this past winter that we're just finishing up now, uh, monarch counts were back up to like 250,000, which is just an incredible uh, spike. Um, it's still, they're still definitely of, of grave conservation concern, even if the population was 250,000 consistently, I think. Um, but that's just a huge, if you do the math on how many butterflies, uh, how many surviving offspring each butterfly would have had to have to, to create that number, it's, it's, it's sort of mind boggling. So ecologists are trying to figure out what happened. Did we miss some counts? Um, did we miss some butterflies the year before? Or was there an influx of butterflies from the Eastern population into the Western population? Or what happened? And there are interesting hypotheses about what exactly happened and really they're still figuring it out. So we'll have to stay tuned for a couple of years to, to, to know more because at this point we're, we're mostly just speculating and looking at little anecdotal evidence. But um, regardless, even though I'm talking mostly about Eastern monarchs, I want folks to know that the Western population is as or more imperiled, probably quite a bit more imperiled than the Eastern population is, so. Okay. So the causes of the decline of monarch butterflies. This is an area of active debate. And I think what everyone can agree on is that it's a combination of things. It's not just one thing. Uh, so the three that I will highlight here, again, with a focus on Eastern monarchs, um, the first is there's been some degradation to the overwintering habitat in Mexico. So some logging, both legal and illegal, um, and then some severe weather events that are associated with climate change that have um, that can cause, like there are big weather events that will cause a kill um, and kill a lot of the butterflies in the overwintering roosts. So that's one issue. The second is stressors along the migration route. And what I mean by that is a couple of things. First of all, uh, monarchs need nectar. Adults, they sip that sugar and they convert that into fat. And then they use that fat to fuel their journey uh, anywhere, but especially south, that's probably the most harrowing journey. Um, and if there are not adequate nectar sources available on the landscape, then they will run out of gas and they will not make it to their destination, they'll expire. And that can happen, they can run out of fuel if there are, if they're flying through really simplified landscapes where there are not a lot of nectar resources. And it seems to be happening again as a result of climate change, because uh, there are droughts that are increasingly frequent in the late summer and early fall or yeah, in the fall that um, if you imagine a droughty brown landscape, there's not as much nectar available on that landscape. So in droughty years, um, mo fewer monarchs seem to make it to Mexico, whereas in really green lush years where there's a lot of floral resources, they do make it to Mexico. Um, also in terms of stressors along the migration route, there are pesticides in lots of our landscapes and they, we're, we're still figuring it out, but those seem to be a really important part of the equation as well, where there's a lot of pesticide exposure, particularly in agricultural landscapes, probably urban too. 
And then finally, this third point here is the loss of milkweed in monarchs breeding range. And common milkweed, while it's still quite common, you can find it on roadsides and in parks and in prairies and lots of places, it used to be a lot more common, uh, particularly because it was an agricultural weed. So in corn and soybean fields for most of the 20th century, there was a lot of common milkweed. And if you grew up on a farm in the Midwest, um, you may have been sent out to walk beans, walk the soybeans and pick milkweed stems um, or root them out with, a, with an implement or something. Uh, but the thing is, if you pull up milkweed stems or if you use mechanical cultivation, which is how weed control happened for most of the 20th century, you can knock down the stems, but you're not touching that big extensive root system and it will very quickly send up new stems. Um, so that was not an effective way of controlling milkweed in agricultural fields. Until the late 1990s, by the late 1990s, most farmers had started using uh, Roundup Ready crops so they can spray glyphosate on their field. It kills all the weeds, including milkweed, and it leaves behind corn and soy or whatever you're growing. Um, and that was a big change. And it's estimated that that removed something like 800 million milkweed stems from the landscapes in the Midwest. And it basically took crop field environments out of the equation as monarch butterfly habitat. And they were probably pretty important, we think. Um, so that was a reduction of about 40% of available common milkweed in the Midwest. That's our best estimate. So those are some of the causes of the decline. And now we can get more positive and talk about ways to help. Um, and here are sort of three anchor points, three main things that are good ways to help. And I think they work across scales. So if you're asking, what can I do in my backyard? These are important. If you're asking, what can I do in my acreage or my farm? I think these are important. And if you're saying I'm a vegetation manager in charge of, uh, I don't know, power line right of ways or something, this is still equally relevant. The first thing is plant or encourage native milkweed if you live where monarchs breed, which I do. And if you're in Michigan, you do. And if you're in the Midwest, you do. Um, the second thing is providing diverse and abundant nectar sources. And this is something you can do anywhere, even if you're not in monarchs breeding range, but they're just flying through, they need uh, proverbial gas stations to refuel. Uh, and that's what you're providing them. So, and they're, they're, they're helpful for monarchs. They're also super helpful for uh, a variety of other insects and they're beautiful and they are biodiversity in and of themselves, they're native plants. So um, provide diverse and abundant native plant nectar resources. Um, that's super important. And the third thing is to avoid pesticides, especially neonicotinoid insecticides, which have become a really a mainstay in some agricultural sectors and used in a bunch of other contexts as well. And I'm not a pesticide expert, but neonics are, they're not really harmful to vertebrates um, or people, but they're super, super toxic to insects. Um, and they stick around in the soil for a really long time and they're systemic in plants and they move around in the soil. So we'll put all those things together. That means it'll stick in the soil for a long time after it's been used. And then in really wet conditions, it'll move through the water into other habitats uh, where then it'll be taken up by plants and that make those plants tissues toxic and make their nectar toxic, uh, which we think is, we're, we're kind of still learning about the impacts of that, but it seems pretty, pretty severe. So avoiding pesticides, especially in neonics, is the third, is the third uh, prong of my monarch conservation trident here. Okay, so let's dive into each of those a little more. Um, thinking about milkweed species to plant, uh, this is Michigan-centric. Uh, there are some resources that will go around in a PDF uh, if, if you live somewhere else and you're curious about what you can plant. Uh, those resources will be made available to you. Uh, but in Michigan, I'll, I'll go through a couple. I've done some of them already, but common milkweed, again, Asclepias syriaca um, is great. It's a little weedy in some, for some contexts. Um, it's a little harder to control, but it's a great plant. It's a beautiful plant. Um, butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa, great in a sandier habitat. It has a big tuber below ground. It does not really spread. Uh, it kind of sits in the same place. It's a little bit more of a finicky plant but it's, it's doable to grow that one. Um, swamp milkweed, if you've got wetter or heavier soils is a great option. Um, yes. Uh, then you might not know about world milkweed. The place you've probably seen it and haven't noticed it is on highway uh, verges. So for whatever reason, it likes that heavy clay soil, but in general, it'll grow in disturbed 
uh, dry kind of severe environments and it has it's whorled, which means it has little rows of leaves that go around the stem. Um, and it has a little white flower and it attracts a lot of interesting insects as well beyond monarchs. And then finally, poke milkweed. If you're in a, if you have a shady backyard and these other species are all kind of full sun, if you want to try poke milkweed, that's a good one. Monarchs will use that as well. This is a woodland species. There are mm, five or six other species native to Michigan. Uh, but these are the most common ones, the ones you're likely to see commercially available, etc. So some fun milkweed species. Uh, I want to put in a note to avoid tropical milkweed. This is most important for people who are like along the Gulf Coast or if you're in California. Uh, tropical milkweed is beautiful and monarchs really like it, but it's kind of a trap. It tricks them into uh, disrupting their normal migratory cycle and they'll, since it's it produces tissues year round. Instead of doing their normal migration, they'll just stay and continually breed on it, um, which might sound good and interesting, but it has some problems. Um, a, they can run, they can uh, run out of food because they'll kind of pile up on it. And then B, probably the bigger issue is actually pathogen accumulation. So there is a protist parasite called we just call it OE. Its name is oh, I'm not going to pronounce it right, but Ophiocystis. Electroscura, that's why we call it OE. Uh, and it produces lots of little football shaped spores that you can't quite see with the naked eye, um, barely see with the naked eye. Um, and on tropical milkweeds that are there year round, they'll actually start to accumulate a lot of these spores and then they'll, uh, they parasitize monarchs um, and they'll reproduce and proliferate within their bodies. And then oftentimes when adults emerge, they can't really spread their wings or they can't expand their wings properly, or they'll just live a really short time and not lay very many eggs. Um, that's also true for um, balloon plant. I think that's Gomphocarpus, which is an ornamental plant in California that's in the milkweed family. Uh, same problem with that one. So I wanna say avoid tropical milkweed. Um, that's tropical milkweed on the left. This is butterfly milkweed on the right. They look pretty similar. Yep. And then finally, I wanted to highlight this study that came out a couple of years ago that I think is really cool and relevant to folks who are thinking about how to design a garden for monarch butterflies. So this is out of University of Kentucky, their entomology department. And they found that in a garden, gar garden setting, the placement and spatial arrangement of milkweeds relative to other plants is really uh, matters a lot. It's very important. So they did this pretty simple experiment where they set up garden plots, and this wasn't really with native species beyond milkweed, uh, but they had a bunch of nectar sources, these sort of formal garden plants, and then they added milkweed either, as you see on the left, in a ring around the nectar sources where the milkweed is on the outside, looks like they use swamp milkweed, um, and then in this next treatment they flipped it and they put the nectar plants around the outside milkweed in the middle. So they kind of hid the milkweed. And then third, they had everything interspersed. And on the right, these bar graphs show how many monarch eggs and caterpillars they found. And when milkweed was planted around the perimeter, uh, they found a lot more eggs and larvae than if it was planted on the interior or intermixed with everything. So that kind of suggests that visual apparency to monarchs might be really important. So if you're thinking about where to put milkweed in your garden, for example, and you really want to see a lot of monarch eggs and caterpillars, take some and put them around the edge or in really prominent places and see if that uh, ups your numbers. So just wanted to highlight that study. I think it's a cool thing to think about when you're designing your garden or your restored prairie or anything like that. Okay, nectar resources. And I'm gonna probably stray a little bit away from monarchs here and talk about some of the other things you can pick up too because they're all really cool. Um, the Xerces Society has really, really good resources for nectar plants for monarchs and for other organisms as well. So I've highlighted here, this is the one for the Great Lakes region. There are other equivalent ones for other regions as well. Um, and they have species lists that look like this where you've got uh, common names and scientific names and their color. Um, information on how tall they grow, how much water they need, uh, notes on light and drought tolerance and um, what sorts of insects they tend to accumulate and stuff. So uh, if you are thinking about how to design uh, a garden, you wanna think about what species to plant, I'd encourage you to look at these lists of, uh, the really good lists of native uh, plants. And I'll just highlight a few of them. Basically, I went through my photo albums and looked for uh, species that had a lot of butterflies and other insects on them that I think are 
uh, really good insect magnets. So one is Missouri ironweed. This is a native uh, prairie and open habitat uh, plant that is a really good insect magnet, brings in butterflies, uh, monarchs, and then also this is, a, this is a giant swallowtail. I think, yeah, this is in my front yard. So fun, fun to, to, to bring in butterflies to your front yard like that. So that's Missouri ironweed. Also, I think New England aster is a great insect plant and it flowers later in the season. So that's that's helpful, more like September. Purple coneflower is a great one. Um, so here, I think that's a pearl crescent on this one. Purple coneflower was actually extirpated from Michigan um, and then I think, and then reintroduced from maybe a population in Indiana or something. Um, so it's it has honorary native status. It's not quite a native genotype usually, but um, it's a great insect replant. It brings in a lot of interesting bees and butterflies. So purple coneflower is a great one. Um, here's a red admiral on a purple coneflower. Um, sand coreopsis is great. Uh, this is a lower statured plant that really likes well-drained soils and it blooms, I want to say June, May, June. Uh, so it's on the earlier end. Um, and this one's kind of a, a double whammy because it brings in a lot of insects in the um, early summer when it's flowering. Uh, you can also cut it back and it'll flower again. So it works in the middle of the summer and then it produces copious seeds that birds really like. So especially goldfinches seem to go after them. So it's a fun plant to have around. Um, I tricked you because this butterfly is not a monarch. This is a viceroy, uh, which is a monarch mimic. So kind of riding on the coattails of monarchs a little bit in terms of looking poisonous, or that's what we used to think. It turns out some of them actually are toxic because they feed on uh, willows and poplars and they accumulate a lot of salicylic acid or what's in um, aspirin. So they, they can be toxic as well, I guess. But this, this sort of uninterrupted line that you see running down its uh, hind wing here is indicator that it's, it's a viceroy, not a monarch. So just tricking you there. All right, bee balm is another great one. I don't know how many Butterflies can get their proboscis down that flower, but it brings in really, really cool bees. This is a black and orange bumblebee or Bombus oricomus. It's like the size of a hummingbird. Super cool insect. Visits bee balm and other um, sort of deeper, deeper flowers that have nectar hidden away. Yellow cone flower is a great one. These are all kind of prairie 101 species if you know your prairie restoration uh, scene. Uh, finally, I love wild indigo. It's another bee magnet. This is a yellow bumblebee, I think. Bombus fervidus, visiting that one. Um, yeah, so lots of options for nectar, and I'd encourage you to look up your Xerxes Society guide to nectar plants for monarchs for your region. All right, I'm going to leave that behind then and talk a little bit about our research at MSU in the entomology department with monarchs. Um, and there's way more than I could talk about, so I'm just going to talk about one piece of it. Uh, but I want to acknowledge some of the folks in our research group who've contributed to this work. So Doug Landis is uh, our, our leader. Uh, and then Sarah Herman and Andrew Myers were PhD students. Uh, they've both since graduated and moved on to other things, but they both were um, instrumental in monarch-related research in our lab group. So I want to give them some credit. Okay. So I want to talk about our work to try to understand the relationship between ecological disturbance or perturbations or things that uh, disruptions in ecosystems and monarchs and milkweeds and things that eat monarchs and what we've learned and what we don't know if we've learned yet and how it might apply to managing habitat. So milkweed, common milkweed in particular, in the Midwest has had a long history of being disturbed or cut back during the growing season. So first of all, I already mentioned that common milkweed stems in corn and soybean fields for most of the 20th century would have been cut back and chopped up by mechanical cultivation. So just dragging big metal implements behind tractors for weed control. Um, and that would have happened into mid late June, depending on when crop canopies closed. Um, and what that probably means is there would have been a lot of milkweed stems, like in my little drawing here, that were regrowing later in the summer versus in undisturbed habitats, like on the edge here, they would have just grown once and then flowered and fruited and senesced. So common milkweed stems may have been cut back repeatedly in crop fields by mechanical cultivation. That's a 
a, a piece of evidence we were interested in. We also know from studies and observations, monarchs tend to prefer, to, not always, but they tend to prefer to lay their eggs on new milkweed growth as opposed to older. So if you offer them like a young fresh milkweed stem and an older stale one, they'll lay their eggs on the young fresh one. Um, third, there have been some observations and observational studies of monarch larvae in very large numbers on milkweed shoots that regrew after disturbance. Um, so in places like hay fields and roadside right of ways where there's regular mowing, uh, milkweed would be uh, removed and it would send up new shoots and those new shoots had a lot of eggs and larvae on them. So that got us just kind of wondering about this relationship. Oh, and here's a picture of some regrowing stems that came up after being mowed, I guess, in this case. So we thought, what are the pathways by which disturbance could affect monarchs? Um, and one of the pathways is shown here, if milkweed resets, or if disturbance resets milkweed phenology, um, and there are new stems coming up, if they are favored by monarchs, they lay more eggs on them. Uh, if monarchs are time limited in how many eggs they can get out of their system, um, by, by disturbance could actually increase the monarch population by giving them better stuff to lay eggs on. The other pathway we were interested in was uh, disturbance could knock back the community of arthropod predators that normally eat monarchs. And I don't have time to talk about our research on this, but our studies and those of other folks have showed that like many butterflies, um, out, of, uh, out of 100 or so monarch eggs, probably between two and maybe 20 of them are going to make it to the later instar caterpillar stage. All the rest of them, as much as, you know, 98% of them are just going to get eaten by other bugs. That's just kind of the way life works if you're an insect. There's a lot of bugs eating bugs. Um, but if we're able to use disturbance to change the predator community and change the rates of predation on monarchs, that could actually affect how many of them survive and make it to adulthood, right? So these were the pathways we were interested in exploring with some experiments. So we did this set of experiments in which we found 23 milkweed patches in, uh, in and around the East Lansing area, around Michigan State University. We found milkweed patches and we did this experiment where we, we cut back stems at different times. So we just used a weed whacker and cut down the milkweed stems and all the vegetation there. I want to point out, this is not being done in a pristine prairie habitat. This is like an abandoned agricultural field that has cool season grasses and some native plants, but a lot of exotic plants too. So we're not, we weren't doing this in pristine, um, super, super high value habitats, but in kind of the weedy environments that common milkweed often grows. You can see we divided this milkweed patch into three. We cut back one third in June. We left one third of it alone as a control. And then we, there was another third that was cut back in July. This picture was taken in June, obviously, so we can't see that. And then we repeated this across 20, 23 milkweed patches. See what happens. And here's sort of a timeline of what that looks like. The undisturbed milkweed will just grow, flower, fruit, and senesce unperturbed. Uh, we mowed some of it back in June. So then a couple of weeks later, there were a bunch of new stems that came up and then those grew throughout the summer. And then we cut some back in July. So we let them grow until then, and then they regenerated in August. So that was, that was our experiment. And we found really strong patterns in that regenerating milkweed stems received a lot more monarch eggs. So we counted up the number of eggs and caterpillars on these stems. These figures here show the horizontal axis is time. So it starts in June and it ends in September. Vertical axis is how many uh, monarch eggs and caterpillars we found. The orange line is the uh, undisturbed control milkweeds. You can see the numbers were consistently pretty low. Uh, then the stuff that regrew after a disturbance in June, uh, in July and August had more eggs on it. So this was not a super strong pattern in 2017, but it was pretty strong in 2018. And then finally, the stems that were regrowing in August after disturbance in July had really high densities of monarch uh, eggs and caterpillars on them. So a really strong, interesting result where monarchs are definitely laying more eggs on the new, new growth. Next, we looked at the predator community and found that the regenerating milkweed stems had far fewer predators on them for the first four or five weeks of growth. So again, the orange line is the undisturbed milkweed stems. The blue line here is what happened in midsummer as the stems regenerated. And then the green line is late summer 
uh, after disturbance in July. And you can see in all cases, there was a period of like four or five weeks where there were a lot fewer arthropod predators around. So more monarch eggs, fewer predators around to eat them. And we wanted to know if that translated into higher survival. So we took about, I think it was 1400 first instar monarch caterpillars that had just hatched and placed them on milkweed stems in these in this experiment and um, basically left them out there to either get eaten by stuff or not uh, for 48 hours and came back to see what happened. And we found that survival was higher on those regenerating stems by a factor of two or two and a half, really high, really strong effect. Um, so this figure here on the right shows first when we measured in July, uh, this blue dot here is, is uh, survival on stems that had been regrowing for a couple of weeks. Um, compared to the orange dot here, uh, that's a factor of about two and a half. So really, really big effect on survival. On the right, this is our measurement at the end of the summer, and you can see that the, the, the new stems at that point were uh, had really high survival, but all the other ones were, were kind of uniformly low. So first in star caterpillar survival was higher. So we were really excited about these findings, right? We found they lay more eggs, there's less stuff to eat them, uh, higher survival. We wanted to know more and, and kind of scale this experiment up beyond what we could do in East Lansing to kind of learn more. And so we started this, this, this project called Regrow Milkweed for Monarchs, which was a community science uh, project. And partly we did this because this is, this is when COVID-19 started and we couldn't do the field work that we wanted to do. And there were a lot of folks cooped up in their homes looking for something fun and interesting to do um, and who cared about monarchs. And so, uh, we asked folks to do this experiment for us wherever they were in the uh, Eastern Monarch range. And so folks went out and found a patch of milkweed in their backyard or wherever they had available. They just divided it in half. They left half of it alone. And then the other half, they cut back with whatever tool they had available um, at different points throughout the summer. And we made like a YouTube channel with instructions for how to how to participate in the study and an, an app that worked most of the time that <laughs> that folks were able to use um, to to send us data. So they told us, you know, when they cut back their milkweed patch, what tools they used to cut it back, and and then they reported every week um, how many uh, eggs and caterpillars they found on their control, their uncut control versus their regrowing milkweed stems. So we did that. It was really fun. We had like. I think about 5,000 people sign up for updates on the project and about 500 who uh, cut back milkweed. And then I think we ended up with a data set of a little over 150 milkweed patches where people uh, did the experiment and then submitted enough data that we could use it in our study. So that was really exciting. It was a lot of fun. Um, and -da, the results were not at all what we expected. So. Uh, Based on our previous work, we had expected that you know there'd be more monarchs on the regrowing stems, and that is not what we found. In fact, on regrowing stems, there were somewhat uh, fewer eggs per stem than there were in the control, and that was it was a, it's not a huge difference, but it was statistically significant. So that was a big surprise. That's why you repeat research because sometimes, in a different context, different things happen. That's a really important point. Science is hard sometimes. So why did this occur? Why is it that in this context, when they cut back milkweed and had it regrow, it did not have the same effect that we found in our studies? And we're still kind of scratching our heads. And I think we know why. And we've done some follow-up data collection this past summer that um, will eventually help us understand. But here's what I think. And you're going to have to bear with me while I speculate a little bit. Um, this on the right here, this is, this is the patterns um, broken out by what tool people used. So I should have said earlier, these are box plots. The thing you need to look at is this bold horizontal line. That's the median number of eggs. So half of the patches had more than that half. It's like an average. It's a little different, but um, that's the median value. When folks use, it turns out most folks who uh, participated in the study, they were, you know, they were working in their backyard and they used hand pruners to individually cut back some milkweed stems and snip them. And they left the surrounding vegetation intact, right? And that's fine. We we you know we were just kind of letting people do whatever they they wanted to, um, and then we we would learn something from 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 how it all boiled out, which we did. Um, 
Most folks used hand pruners, and among those that did, the overall pattern matched. It matched the overall pattern in this study. However, there was a smaller group of people who used uh, string trimmers and brush hogs and other things that clear out milkweed and also the surrounding vegetation. And in that case, those regrowing stems tended to have more eggs and caterpillars on them. So we think, we're not sure yet, and the statistics haven't really borne out yet, but we think it probably has to do with the exact methods that you're using to disturb milkweed. And this is, this is kind of a bummer to me because um, removing a lot of vegetation has other effects on the, on the ecosystem, right? And it might be acceptable in some contexts, but it's too much disturbance in others. So we were kind of thinking, wouldn't it be cool if you could snip milkweed back with hand pruners in your backyard and enhance habitat for monarchs? But we don't have evidence that that works. And we're speculating again, but if you think back to that, um, that study I showed you from University of Kentucky, where when, the monarch, when milkweed is kind of hidden behind other plants, monarchs don't lay as many eggs on it. I kind of think that's what's happening here. Again, I'm speculating, but um, I think that when milkweed re-sprouts and there's a lot of intact big garden vegetation around it, monarchs aren't finding it to lay eggs on it. Or if they are, there's an intact predator community around that milkweed that attacks, uh, eats the monarch eggs. And that doesn't happen if you clear out the surrounding vegetation. So that's what I, I, I think is going on there. But that was a, that's, science is tricky, right? Um, and it's even trickier to think now about what does this all mean for managing monarch butterfly habitat? And I hate to say when things are, you know, it's uncertain and we need more research, but I think that's really the case here. I do think there's some um, conclusions we can make. And one is that it seems like phenological diversity in milkweed is probably important for monarchs. And what I mean by phenological diversity is diversity or variation in the timing of when they're growing. So if they're all uniform and they all sprout up at the same time and they all flower and then senesce, that would be very little phenological diversity. And we showed that at least in some contexts by creating new growth later in the season, it seems like that's a really valuable resource. Um, similarly, if you've ever seen the first monarchs to arrive in the breeding range, sometimes they actually arrive before there's very much milkweed that's popped up out of the ground yet. So some of those really early emerging stems might also be really important. Um, as really rare resources on the landscape when the first uh, migrants arrive. So phenological diversity, I think there's a case to be made that that's pretty important. And then that kind of brings up the question, could we tweak disturbance regimes in grasslands and stuff where common milkweed grows? So places, there's a lot of common milkweed grows in a lot of kind of weedy, nasty spots uh, that are not, you know, pristine habitats, roadsides, hay fields, places that get mowed down regularly. Um, and maybe we could think about the schedule of when they're being mowed down in a, in a way that benefits monarchs instead of um, potentially not benefiting them. And then finally, I want to mention ecological traps. And that's my silly um, drawing or, or, or the mouse trap thing that I've got a picture there on the right. And an ecological trap is just something when, when there's a resource or something that draws in organisms or draws in um, monarch butterflies and then ultimately reduces their fitness, right? So if, uh, here's an example that I think is, pro that I think uh, could, could be really important. So um, imagine a roadside on the side of the highway that gets mowed by the Department of Transportation crews. Um, if, if it's mowed once, it might actually produce some new milkweed stems that are um, attractive to monarchs. So you could bring in a lot of monarchs, have a high concentration of caterpillars. If it's mowed again a few weeks later, um, it'll actually kill them all, right? And that would be an example of an ecological trap. And I think probably we have some ecological traps out on our landscape that have to do with like mowing schedules. And so it would be important to, in, in locations where there's like roadsides where they're maybe being mowed more than once per season, reduce it to once per season or increase the time interval between the mowing events. So that's what that's where I think this is going in terms of why our research matters and how we can help improve monarch habitat. Um, there's a lot of cases, though, I want to say where managing with disturbance is probably super inappropriate. So in pristine habitats, um, mowing in particular is not a good idea. But in pristine prairies, um, if you're a prairie restorationist, you might know that uh, growing season burns that occur during the summer are super interesting and a rare form of disturbance that um, can be really beneficial to the plant community. Um, and then when there's milkweed growing in there, that would be a great source of disturbance that produces new stems later in the summer. Um, 
places where there are other milkweed species other than common milkweed, which is what we did our research with, I would not recommend cutting back butterfly weed or other species really. Um, they don't have the same root structure or resilience to disturbance that common milkweed does. So it's not gonna work. So don't do this with other species. Um, if there's a lot of resources for other pollinators around, don't do disturbance events that remove those resources. You might be helping monarchs a little bit, but at the cost of um, taking resources away from other species. And then finally, some places there's restrictions around ground nesting birds and stuff. So another case where managing with disturbance is probably inappropriate. Um, but I do think it's worth thinking about where disturbance is already occurring and where it could be adjusted, roadside rights away, um, hay fields, and maybe your own property. Maybe you have an intermittently mowed old field or something like that. Um, you can also experiment at a very small scale, at a surgical scale, by if you have a patch of common milkweed, um, go in and knock some of it back and then make a, make a casual comparison uh, between what grows up and what you leave alone. See if you can attract more monarchs that way. So. Yeah. All right. That's what I have for you. And it looks like I went over time a little bit. So that's too bad. I don't know how much time we'll have for questions, but um, I hope this was helpful and informative to you all. Thanks, Nate. That was just so great. I learned a lot of extra stuff. The whole uh, regrow thing is so interesting and the timing of um, disturbance and stuff. That's really, that's really interesting. We do have a lot of questions. Um, one, a lot of uh, specific questions about milkweed to grow in different types of soil and things. But before we get to that, um, one question we had was, do you know any good control measures for oleander aphids? They have been devastating my milkweeds. I really don't. Um, I would say the best control method is squish them <laughs> with your fingers. Uh, I think probably getting to them early is a good move. Um, their populations can grow exponentially. So if you can squish them early when you find them, then you'll keep them from getting into like outbreak status. Yeah, so oleander aphids are those bright orange aphids that you might see just totally ransacking milkweed. That happens sometimes. It seems to vary year to year and location to location. Um, I don't, you know, the, the more traditional ways of dealing with it would be like, insecticides, but that's going to be really counterproductive, right? Um, so I don't recommend doing that. I think just squish them with your hands. You can um, spray them off with water. Yeah, that kind of thing. I don't have a great answer for you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I, one of our questions were, do you work with farmers for pollinator strips? Um, in other parts of my job, yes. Yeah. So, uh, Pollinator strips and, and what we, we've been calling prairie strips in general are a really cool conservation technique um, in which uh, in a crop field, you can dedicate a small percentage of it to having these linear strips of native prairie with a lot of um, resources for pollinators and for natural enemies of crop pests. Um, and that strip is super, super multifunctional. So it really helps with soil erosion. It helps keep water that's running across your field, uh, it kind of catches it and settles it in place so it doesn't start carrying off your soil. It's um, great for pollinators. It's great for um, harboring predatory insects that then go out and eat weed seeds or eat crop pests and keep those in check. Um, yeah, prairie strips are super cool. So um, yeah, we do work with some farmers on that. And we have at Kellogg Biological Station, which is our, uh, our big MSU biological station uh, down uh, a little north of Kalamazoo, Michigan, we have uh, an experiment going in now that has different cropping systems that have prairie strips and kind of the sandy unproductive parts of the fields are being converted to prairies and then we're going to be looking at uh, what effect that has in terms of lots of different ecological benefits yeah okay cool all right another question um, from Susan she said she lives in deep south Texas and in um, fall and even into November, there are still eggs being laid in my yard. Are these adults heading south to wintering grounds or what's their status, I guess? Yeah, and uh, having never been to South Texas, <laughs> that's my qualification on this answer. Uh, my understanding is a lot of the butterflies will fly straight from the breeding grounds all the way south. Um, but there's a small percentage of them that will stop over and lay eggs for another generation, and then those will fly south. So they'll do a two-step thing on their way south, and that happens in 
Texas and surrounding states. Um, I, as far as I know, that's fine, and that's a thing that happens as long as you're as long as it's not on like tropical milkweed where you're kind of tricking them into breaking their migratory cycle altogether. Yeah. All right. Um, what about a weed called goat weed? Um, do you know anything about that? I'm afraid I don't. I'm sorry. All right. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, can you recommend a less invasive time frame for mowing side roads in the Lake Superior area? Hmm. There are some restrictions that have to do with ground nesting birds and stuff, and I don't want to run afoul of those, but I would say if there are areas being mowed twice, just do it once. Um, and we found that we've the experimental mowing that we've done has been in the middle of June and in the middle of July. Um, and we found stronger effects in July, except if it's like a droughty year, in which case there's not a lot of milkweed regrowth those years or on like really unproductive sandy soils, which you might have some parts of the UP. So I would, I, you know, like July, July one, if you can, but you know, in a lot of cases, not mowing all together is better. It has more benefits, but if you're doing it anyway, yeah, middle of the summer. Okay. All right. What about, what are your thoughts on raising monarchs in netted cages? Um, I think it can be educational in certain contexts for people to do that, you know, in kids' classrooms and stuff. Um, it is not helping monarch conservation and it is potentially harming it a little bit. Mostly because keeping them in enclosures like that is a way to, if you get a little bit of pathogen contamination, it'll spread to all of them. So if you are, if you're farming monarchs and then releasing them to add to the population, you're probably likely to, unfortunately, even though, you know, it's with the best intentions, you're likely to do more harm than good by adding pathogens to the population. Okay. All right. That's good. Sorry. That's good. No, no, that's good to know. Cause a lot of people are doing that. So um, here's a question. Where did all our caterpillars go after consuming all our milkweed? They disappeared. <laughs> did birds <laughs> eat them? or what? So yeah, lot, lots of things could have happened. Um, fifth instar caterpillars, the big ones that really, those are basically for their first three instars, they'll, they'll cumulatively eat like a part of one or two leaves and that's it. And then in their fifth instar, they'll like eat a whole leaf and another whole leaf and another whole leaf. Um, in their fourth or fifth instar, they climb off of their natal plant or the plant where their egg was laid and they'll go looking for other food elsewhere. And I'm not sure if that's because the plant the plants actually start to produce more toxins when they are that's triggered by getting chewed on so much. So it might be the plant gets too toxic, or it could be this plant is now covered in caterpillar poop and looks really ragged and it's going to attract birds or parasitoid wasps or something. So I'm going to get away from here, but they leave. So that could be what happened. Um, and then finally, they uh, when they are ready to pupate, they'll walk, they'll just get off the plant and walk. And I'm, I think the distance they'll go is really variable, but I've found that I found some chrysalises that were in really isolated locations and tried to pace off where is the nearest milkweed that they could have walked from, like in my front yard. And um, I found a chrysalis that was not within 20 meters of a milkweed plant. So that caterpillar just climbed down and walked. <laughs> so maybe that's what happened. Oh, wow. Yeah, they were taking a walkabout. So yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think about students lobbying to have highway right-of-ways remaining unmowed? Oh, in a lot of contexts, that's a great idea. Um, th there are other benefits that can come from not mowing. We have too much mowing in our landscapes altogether, so it's good. It's better for birds. Um, there can be really great opportunities to restore prairies along roadsides as well. Um, some states' departments of transportation, they're pretty advanced with this. Iowa, actually, along their county highways, there's really cool linear restored prairies along their roadsides. That's a much better use of that space than mowing it. Um, I think probably there are some landscapes that just kind of have to be mowed because it's that's the legal code or the, the, uh, there's going to be hay harvest there or it has to, you know it's it's in an area that needs to be cut back for one reason or the other and in those that, those are the areas where I think we can tweak it but yeah I'm totally in favor of not mowing lots of things that we currently mow right that's yeah. as an ecologist I, I want to see more more wild places sure 
Um, all right, let's see here. Um, what about um, if, if somebody has just a container garden, a small space, are any milkweeds better for that type of a garden situation? Well, if you grow common milkweed, it won't escape and spread everywhere else because it's in a <laughs> container. So there's that, uh, but it's kind of a tall gangly plant. I have grown um, butterfly weed successfully in a, like a, a barrel in landscaping. That worked, um, that was fine. That plant stays put and you know it needs, I don't know, a few square feet and then it's not, it's not gonna do more than that. Uh, world milkweed is very small. It likes very well-drained soils. So you, that would maybe not work in your container. I don't know, but uh, that's a very small plant. So that's a possibility. Otherwise, there's lots of nectar plants that are great for bringing in, um, you know, bees and butterflies more broadly that just go for the small ones. Oh, prickly pear cactus is a great one. It's not going to bring in monarchs, but there's some cool bees that visit prickly pear cactus. We have in Michigan, uh, two, I think, native species, but one, Apuntia humifusa, has this big, beautiful orange flower that attracts a lot of interesting bees. That's a great container plant. Okay, cool. Um, well, just one more question. If you, do you know anything about the difference between managing for monarchs, Eastern and Western populations? I just want to say most of what I talked about with our research is specific to Eastern monarchs, where a lot of their habitat was historically like crop fields and very disturbed environments. And we're thinking about um, how to how to manage those. I think in the in the West, it's really different. And I, I partly I just don't know because I'm not an expert on, you know, the milkweeds of the Southwest, but I would say a lot of what I talked about is not relevant if you're living in that environment, except the basic idea that neonicotinoids and other insecticides are a problem. It's always great to add native nectar resources and it's good to add native milkweed if you're in their breeding range. Okay. All right. Um, a question about in Mexico, um, does it matter to stop using pesticides? It seems like it would and move on to agroecological managing better. Yes. Yes. I think, <laughs> yeah. I, I, practices that reduce the number of insecticides that monarchs and other insects, which are also many of them are declining, uh, that's a that's a good thing to do, reducing their exposure. Um, and then farm farmed landscapes that have more plant and flower diversity and that are more complex and have more places for butterflies to stop, um, as opposed to being really denuded landscapes. Those are good things for migratory butterflies and for other insects as well. All right. I'm trying to see. Lots of um, thank you very much. And um, I want to let everybody know um, if you don't, if you haven't seen it already, but this presentation is being recorded and you can go back and watch it again and uh, check out the, the, the parts that maybe you missed. Um, it, there will be a link uh, to a YouTube uh, video on our website in a few days. Um, I think we're gonna call it good with the questions at this point. Um, thanks, um, Nate, again to you and everybody who is watching from all, all of the many places. Check out your Wild Ones chapter wherever you might live. Um, you can do some good things by and getting some good information from the Wild Ones chapters. Um, this is just the beginning of our good programs for this year. Uh, our April program, as Marty mentioned earlier, will be a field trip to the Hudsonville Nature Center, where we will be taking a hike and looking for spring ephemeral wildflowers. Um, also, remember to register for our 15 year anniversary event um, that will open in May. And then we also have our native plant sale in July. So there you will be able to buy some of these wonderful milkweeds and a whole bunch of other different great native plants. So look for that information um, on our website. Um, I think that's all I've got for now. Nate, thanks again. It's been great. Um, good night, everybody, and have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm.